<laughs> well, hey, man, it's great to meet you. Thank you for taking a minute out today. And before we get into your life, you know, I want to kind of address what we've all lived through, which has been a huge thing for all of us to deal with and its changes, which has been COVID. And I'm curious how you survived that time period and how it's changed the way that you view life and live and do business now. Yeah, so that's interesting because COVID basically became a thing right after I retired from the military. And yeah. um, I started my consulting company right around the same time. I didn't realize it. You know, I started, you know, in the beginning of uh, 2020, the COVID popped in a couple months later, which I thought was going to be difficult uh, considering a lot of government contracts and whatnot are done in person. There's a lot of conferences and whatnot, but in actuality, it was probably a really good coincidence um, yeah. that people were going to virtual because it allowed us to, allowed me to just the technology and everything. So for me, that's where I started uh, my business. I, a lot of consulting, a lot of working with businesses and the government was pivoting to like Zoom and WebEx and Microsoft Teams and all of that too. So yeah. Um, from that standpoint, it, it, it wasn't, I can't complain. Um, you know, it's it, obviously it was challenging for everybody kind of going through it, um, you know, with the kids and everything and that, you know, I have young kids, so we had to deal with, you know, how are we going to get them educated and work at the same time and be in the same house. So uh, yeah. there was a little bit of that. That was, that was probably one of the biggest challenges for us. So did you write, retire right before COVID happened? I did. I retired in 2019. Wow. Yep. Yeah, that's quite a change. But I guess if you're going through a change, you know, it's not like you want that to happen, but it's probably just part of the process. Yeah. Um, a lot of people in the military went through a big change when that happened as well. So a lot of, for government civilians and for military officers and whatnot, a lot of working from home, telecommuting, you know, or maybe just office days, one to office days a week. So there's some big changes there. You know, it's not that the, I don't know how to, I, I'm, I'm trying, I want to word this the right way. I think yeah. that the military has a bead on things that, that civilians don't. And, you know, a lot of inventions, lots of things that we all civilians take part in come from military advancements and innovation. So I'm curious if at any time during your service, there was ever any talk of this is how we're going to deal with the pandemic. If it comes in, had that ever happened? Not, not specific to like a national pandemic, right? But, right. you know, one thing that the military does a great job in is training and, and taking a look at different situations. So there's a lot of training around how we're going to deal with an attack and that could be a biological attack. So chem bio, there's a lot, a lot of training for everybody uh, as far as that's concerned, but specific to like being in the, this country with a pandemic like that, I, I can't recall going through anything specific okay. for that. I was but just curious. About resiliency. Yeah. yeah. Just popped into my head. I was just thinking, you know, if anybody on the planet would have had some kind of bead or some level of rhetoric that would have gone into it, I would have thought it would be the military. Um, sure. And, and by the way, somebody in the military may have. I just, in particular, right. did. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So let's get to kind of the essence of what you do on a daily basis. And I'm going to hypothetically put you in front of a bunch of third graders. You're a okay. career day. One of the kids looks up and says, hey, what do you do for a living? How do you answer them? I would say that I would probably start out by telling them that I retired from the Air Force and I flew for the first half of my career because they that usually is going to get a third grader's attention, you know, because that's uh, a little more uh, hip than being an acquisitions officer. And then I would explain how I switched into acquisitions about halfway through my career. And that's the profession of putting companies on contract for the government. And so that now I help companies provide goods and services and technology to mostly the U.S. military, but also some of the other federal agencies. Um, and that helps our warfighters execute the mission. So whether that is a technology on an aircraft or a piece of software being used on the ground, or even a landscaping company that's, um, you know, that's uh, taking care of the soccer fields for, you know, our kids that are living on the bases so they can play soccer after school. You know, those are the type of things that I am helping with. So 
a little backstory on me that involves the Air Force. My dad was born in Brooklyn, raised in Long Island, and wanted so badly to see the world that he joined the military. And that's why I'm in Kansas City. He went to Richards Gebauer. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fell nice. in love, had kids. Um, but I remember him telling me stories of he was there when Vietnam was happening and when uh, when the whole Bay of Pigs thing happened, he was telling me about there used to be diodes, lights on the wall that would go to DEFCOM and it got right there. And he was like, you know, I'm ready to go if, if I need to. So I always remember yeah, that story that's, and how that's that worked. Scary. Yeah. Yeah. My dad was in around the same time. And uh, yeah, those stories did translate into now. So we still have a lot of those, especially when I came in in 99 and uh, I was flying reconnaissance aircraft and we had a lot of those um, holdovers from the arms race where, you know, I won't get too far into that, but yeah, we were absolutely trained to be able to go at a moment's notice um, to get all of the scramble our aircraft. And we trained on that and to ensure that we were ready for any type of worldwide um, attack or problem, whether that was nuclear or, or something else. So were you in there during 9-11? I was, yeah, I was. What, what, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I still to this day feel a level of separation. I was in the back of a water taxi in Venice, Italy, and I literally didn't see any of the video footage that everybody saw over and over again until I got home almost a week later. And that was a whole other scramble story to get back home. But how quick did thing mo things mobilize then? I mean, when did you, was it like, boom, this is happening, this is what we're doing? Well, we were, I can speak for what I was doing, right? So, you know, with any of the military flying missions, at least, you know, you're always training for some type of mission. And talking about reconnaissance or or transport or maybe some of the stuff the spec, spec ops guys are doing, you're going to have missions going on in peacetime and in wartime. I guess the real question becomes what what just happened and what are we going to do about it, right? Versus do we have to mobilize? So we were already, you know, we were we were deploying anyway. We were going on deployments overseas and and whatnot. It was now just quickly being vectored towards, okay, what just happened in 9-11? Who is responsible for this and, and what's the nation going to do about it? Uh, but I could tell you that um the level of deploying and for and flying for me and you know some of my brothers and sisters that were doing the same thing exponentially increased from what they were doing in peacetime, relative peacetime in the 90s. There were a few things that happened there, obviously, but um, you know, leading up to that, I mean, I spent that first 10 years that I was in uh deployed absolutely overseas wow. and different countries. Yeah. So when you were in the third grade, what was your dream? What did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, one of the things I wanted to do was fly. I'd be I'd be lying if I uh, if I said something else. But you know, I was always interested in business. Um, you know, my dad owned a painting company. I was always kind of selling stuff door to door and, and doing that type of thing. Um, so I was interested in business. I was definitely interested in flying and being in the military as well. And those are probably the the two things I my two major interests back then. And playing the guitar. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I see it over there. Yeah. So. Yep. Let me ask you this. What were some of the seeds that were planted in you to get into the military and to become who you are today? Take me back to where you were born and raised and how all that was kind of cultivated in you. Sure. Uh, so I was born in Burlington, Massachusetts, uh, which is a suburb about a half hour or so north of Boston. And my dad, I have a sister. My dad uh, was in the Air Force, like we talked about, uh, as an enlisted uh, troop. He um, he joined the Air Force during Vietnam. He knew the draft was coming his way, so he joined, I guess you could say preemptively, right? So he knew that, you know, that's probably would have been the best branch for him. And uh, then came back, finished college after that, met my mom, who was a school teacher. And so my dad started his own business. He had a, a painting and plastering company, just a small, you know, kind of manual labor business. And so, yeah, I grew up in that area. And I would say as far as the seeds, uh, you know, I... I always saw my dad running his business and, you know, able to do pretty well uh, doing that. I saw some of the struggles too. I also got a chance to work with him for years and years. Uh, so I learned the value of hard work and, you know, sitting on top of a 40 foot ladder. But, uh, you know, I would say a lot of the seeds were planted both from his stories because he had the option to come into the military as an officer, which I didn't know anything about. I didn't know there was a difference between the officer ranks and the enlisted ranks. 
And uh, he had an, off- an opportunity to come back after college to go through flight school. But, you know, at that point, he'd already served and he turned it down. I think he always kind of regretted it a little bit. Yeah. And so this is something that I always heard, like, hey, I would say the one thing I always heard was, especially going through college, is there's no place that your bachelor's degree will mean more than in the military, because that's kind of the, the prerequisite to becoming an officer. And yeah. um, I heard it enough times. I was reading a lot of books. He took us traveling around the world. So that was all. Uh, I think there and yeah, by the time I was a senior in college, I was I was ready to go. Cool. So who's been kind of a role model or a hero for you in your life? Oh, I mean, I've had a lot of uh, role models. I would say early on, it was, you know, I looked at a lot of the uh, early astronauts that, you know, kind of did the uh, the moon landings. I've always, uh, I've always admired people who could turn something they were passionate about into a business, you know, kind of like uh, like Arnold Schwarzenegger or whatnot. And, um, you know, I've also loved, you know, just some of the the writers that are out there and uh, some of them that have incorporated kind of philosophy into what they were doing, uh, you know, whether it was like C.S. Lewis or Ayn Rand and growing up. So, I mean, I would say kind of a, a, oh, a smattering of all of that. There are probably a couple of uh, guitar players thrown into that, there you know, you but Ad- Adventurers, Shackleton was a big... Uh, you know, reading about his exploits, a lot of adventurers. So that, that that was the kind of thing I was into and I was reading about, I would say, uh, pre-military. What was the first book that you read that really like flipped the light on for you, whether you wanted to write or read more? What was the book? You, you know, I did a lot of, probably like a lot of uh, high school, middle school age kids. I was doing, I was kind of stuck in that, you know, sci-fi realm back then but you know once i hit college i started um reading more and more kind of pivoting right so it started it was tom clancy then it was you know just kind of reading the the on the road and the jack kerouac stuff and getting into um god what was the name of that book about um about the i'm trying to think of it it was was a great book and the, the right stuff so i remember reading the right stuff that was a big book for me um, even some of the uh, not some of the fiction about you know uh, the fighter aircraft kind of the military culture like the great Santini you know and there's a lot of different elements going on in that book. Um, there were certainly books about Shackleton. The, John Krakauer was a great uh, writer, adventure writer. So I think a lot of those books were really kind of fueling the fire for me as far as what I was going to be doing uh, later in life. And of course, then the the Atlas Shrugs and you know yeah. some of that type of thing really, uh, I think had a profound impact. You know, it's interesting. I keep hearing all this stuff about AI and I can't shake thinking about the monolith and Arthur C. Clarke and Space Odyssey. It's like all of those things in this modern era, like all these dystopian sequences we've been living through. It's wild. All that literature that I grew up, you know, 1984 and Bradbury and all those things. It's like, I don't know if that's happened historically or if it's this slice of history. It seems like the older I get, the more I see all of these novels becoming slices of our world and what we're living through now. It's it's really amazing. It seems and you're right. Every time I see a new sci-fi technology that doesn't exist, my thought is how long before this really, you know, comes to the table and it becomes a reality. Because you're right. I mean, a lot of the things that I can remember watching a I was telling my daughter this the other day. I remember watching a uh, one of those TV movies, made for TV movies, which of course the kids today don't even get because they don't no. have to watch and deal with commercials. But no, uh, this was probably in the early '90s or the late '80s, and I. But I remember in there the girl. Um, there was a a kid, a student. And they're like, the mom asked one of the kids, "Hey, when was, you know, who was a president after Clinton or who was a president after Reagan or something?" And she just asks, she just says it out loud. And she gets a response from her computer. And I remember back then thinking, oh, that's amazing. Imagine if that could be. And of right. course, now we have Siri and Alexa and every, everything else. Yeah, it's wild how all that stuff has come to I know come it. to pass. Um, so let me ask you this. If you can meet anybody alive right now on the planet and spend a little time with them, who would it be? Ooh, that's a really good question. There are There are a lot of people. Uh, that I would like to meet. I, I I love, I really love kind of the birth of the country and, you know, reading about the different presidents. So I would probably want to meet with kind of each of the presidents that's still alive today yeah, and just kind of pick their brain and, and see some of the things that they've had to deal with. Um, there were certainly, 
you know, a couple of generals that I'd like to sit down with and General Petraeus and, and a few others that just kind of hear their, um, you know, their take on things when they were in and hear, you know, what strategies they use. You can read about it, but it's always better. You know, I've worked with some kind of higher ranking uh, general officers and um, that have done some incredible things. And just being in their presence and, and learning from them is it can is always interesting and you can, you can always learn a lot. It's probably a couple of guitar players I'd throw in there too. Yeah, absolutely. You got, so, keep throwing that in. You got to have fun, right? Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. You absolutely do. Yeah, yeah. I got to have that sense of adventure and and uh, get in there and have fun. So, what has ultimately been the motivator for you? You know, you're obviously highly driven, focused. What has been that motivation for you that's always pulled you through the proverbial day? Yeah, I think it changes, um, but there's a sense of responsibility, certainly. You know, there's there's definitely a sense of passion and of wanting to help people. But I think by the time I got into the Air Force and, you know, a lot of people join the military for different reasons than they stay in. And, and I've heard that from a lot of people and it was certainly true for me, right? So whereas I got in and began my career really after that sense of adventure and kind of that lust for life and probably selfish reasons if I'm if I'm being honest, but you stay in because you start realizing the effects that you have. You start getting a more, you know, the world becomes a smaller place. You start understanding what's going on in different countries, um, you know, the political agreements that we have, how you're impacting, you know, people in this country and in others, even something just like, you know, flying on a, a big aircraft where you have, you know, 25 people on there that are depending on you to do your job correctly. So you, you land and everyone makes it off. Uh, you know, for me, doing the right thing, and making sure that the people depending on me are, are being served is a huge motivator, you know, and also, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a dreamer. So I, I have pretty big goals and having the military and I do now. So I think that creative, that creative spark in the sense that anything is possible, like even with the technology stuff we're talking about yeah. is a motivator. So I guess it depends on what I'm doing, but those are some of the things that, that motivate me. So when you look back on your life of all the things that you've done, you know, everything that you've either succeeded in or had to overcome builds wisdom. Let's say you have a dream tonight. You run into the 20 year old version or the high school senior version of yourself. You could give that version of you a piece of advice based on the wisdom you've gained in this life. What would you tell that younger version of you? I, I, I would have a lot of, a lot of things to say to that uh, young man. One of them would be to stop screwing around because for me me in particular it, it was probably halfway through college before I started getting serious about you know studying and, and what I wanted to do uh, with my life but also the sense that if you try hard enough or long enough uh, doing something and you're you're creative in the process you could you could probably make anything happen so it's really dedicating yourself and and trying not to be distracted and you know kind of a mixture of that and ensuring, you know, hey, I don't think I don't think I'd have to tell me back then <laughs> this, but I would tell other people. I mean, having having a sense of honesty and you know, all integrity, certainly, and wanting to help people. I think that that's part of it as well. So when we look at that timeline and what you've done with your life, what are you the proudest of? Well, I'm the proudest of the family that I have right now. I mean, yeah. that's, you know, without saying, because we've, you know, they were with me at least through part of that. And that, um, you know, that's difficult on a family. And, and I love, you know, what we've created there. But uh, I'm proud of my military career, certainly. And, you know, the friendships I've made in there, because you read about those things, about, you know, the brothers in arms and whatnot. And that's, that's a real thing. There is a bond that you create with other people when you are um, when you're going through it, it's, it usually happens during the hardest times. So it's when you're, um, you know, deployed in the Middle East or and you're living out there for months in a tent or, you know, flying tough missions. I mean, you, you really, um, those are some some friendships that, you know, I don't think I could recreate anywhere else. Uh, I'm certainly proud to have served the country, you know, for as long as I did. And I think those are, you know, there were some real achievements in there. And and hopefully we helped in in at least a small way and played our part. But, you know, I think about my career and I think in the military, I think about, you know, the family that I have now. And then, you know, we're helping, you know, with through my consulting business, we're helping a lot of small businesses, you know, recognize that there's an opportunity out there for them. Um, 
you know, with the military and, and, you know, I'd like to think that I'm improving their lives as well as their businesses. So uh, that's, that's what I'm working towards now is to, to continue, continue getting better at that. And I know hopefully that's a good answer for your question, but no, it's good. Mind. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. So when you look at the history of our military and all of the moments, whether it was signing declarations or being on the top of a, of a, of a, of a ship and, and ending a war, whatever it might be, what would be one moment in history you would like to walk into and watch and witness with your own eyes? I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the birth of the country. And maybe that's because I grew up in Massachusetts and, you know, I got to yeah. live in the, the Concord Lexington area where kind of all began, but um, I, I am really intrigued by the birth of the country and, and how we came to be. And, you know, it probably a lot of things that could have happened to throw that off, but it was a struggle and it seems like a really, you know, I love starting things. And that seems like one of the the greatest moments in history where something was started. And we all know it's not perfect, but, you know, those, the the individuals that were, were part of that, I think, uh, you know, I find very interesting and intriguing. So of all of the work that you've done in your life, you know, we all get feedback. What's been the best feedback, best fan letter you've ever gotten from your work? Now, I think that, I would, I would change the question and say, or maybe, maybe, maybe I would just re- reframe it a little bit because the best feedback I've gotten is probably been the negative feedback. Um, you know, if yeah. someone tells you, you do a good job, if someone tells me they're doing a good job, that's, that's great. You know, everyone likes to hear high praise, but it's the times that I've probably failed and I've had somebody to walk me through that failure to uh, get me to succeed those have been the times that I really grew. And, you know, the military officer corps has a great way of, um, of taking an individual and, you know, training them, breaking them down, training them, and then giving them responsibility, giving them a scope, right? Whether you're leading people or you're doing something difficult or dangerous or you're managing money. And, you know, you might fail a couple of times within there, but once you master it, they come back, they reward you, and they start increasing that. And they are constantly increasing that workload and increasing the money you're managing, the the danger, the amount of people you're leading, the, you know, they keep piling it on top of each other when, until you get to a point where you're, you know, if you look back, you're like, wow, I've really increased kind of the scope and breadth of, of what I could do. Um, and, and there have certainly been moments throughout my career, whether it was, you know, probably public speaking related early on, you know, where I was getting critiqued on how to stand up and give a speech to a hundred people that, you know, might be in my organization. Um, and there have certainly been uh, plenty of those moments or, you know, later on in my career when, you know, I know that we were, you know, even, even right before I retired, you know, in more now in the leadership role overseas, I was in Saudi Arabia and we had, you know, quite a, um, quite a scope of work and responsibility on our hands and working with, I can remember there's a general and a colonel out there I was working with on how to properly manage the thousands of moving parts and the billions and billions of dollars in contracts that we were working on. Um, you know, those are the moments that I look back on and, and when I'm reflecting on, you know, my growth, my personal growth, like those are the ones that I remember when someone was kind of helping me through a problem set. So that tends to be kind of the heart and mind of an entrepreneur. You know, you embrace the failure because that's when you learn the most. Yeah. You know? No question. Yeah. And no question. I mean, and I know too, in, in my history, I started doing pod. I didn't even call it podcasting. I was just interviewing musicians back in 2011. And I remember some very seminal conversations where people would point things out and that's huge, you know, because we all want to do it right, but sometimes you're so close to it. You need people from the macro saying, you know, you know, we can do something different and it's good. It's how we grow. Yeah. No, you're you know? absolutely right. Absolutely. It, right. It's like parenting. It's like, sometimes you got to pull the kids aside and say, look, I got like three decades on you, four decades. Just let's, let's, let's talk about it a little bit, you know? So it's, absolutely. It, it's definitely good. So let me ask you this. Let's get to kind of the heart and soul of who you are. Everyone out there, you have all these pockets of people that know you and experience you, family, friends, colleagues, clients, but you Mm -hmm. ultimately are in charge of everything. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? Well, I would like to think that I'm a great husband and father. 
when I think about, you know, me as a human being, I'd, I'd like to think that, you know, people think of me as someone they can depend on and help them through difficult situations. So if something, um, something hard is happening, whether it's a complete catastrophe, or it's just a, a difficult problem set that needs to be worked through. I would like to think people would uh, think, you know, Ricky Howard could come in and that's somebody they could trust to help them through it, or at least point them in the right direction. Um, you know, I'd like to think that I'm, I'm an honest uh, person who, you know, has hopefully uh, shown that I have the ability to work hard and that I'll, I'll be, I'll be frank with people and provide the value in some way. And, uh, you know, that's, that's my perception of myself. I'm a, sure. a man of faith as well and, and family and, and hopefully I'm fun to be around too. So, you know, I do like to get the, I know you, you interview musicians as well. I like to get the kids in here and get the drums and the guitars and everything going and, yeah. and, and fun with everyone. So um, that's probably the, the, the big picture of who I'd say I, I like to think I am. So if anyone out there wants to learn more about you, anything that you do, where's the best place on the web for them to go? Yeah, I know it's a good question. So they can go to dodcontract.com. That's my uh, website for our business uh, where we you can either learn a little bit about uh, selling to the government, no matter what industry you're in. It, the government buys just about everything. We have some free training on there. I also have a podcast called DOD Contract Academy. And so that also is no cost. And uh, LinkedIn, you can find me on LinkedIn under uh, Ricky C. Howard. And you'll see my profile there. So, I mean, uh, there's a, a few places where they can find out a little bit more. Right on. That is, you know, Boston is the one place that I haven't been to in this country that I really want to get to. I, I hear so much about it. And there's so much lore that goes into that town. You should check it out. There, There is a lot that uh, goes on here. It'd be, uh, it'd be interesting for you to check it out.